so the idea that still women are woven in the scripture doing crazy, cool, bold, courageous things, um, learning some lessons the hard way, still being a little bit messy like all of us are, human beings are. But that showed me that I, as a woman, can be bold in my calling. I can walk in purpose and not in seeking approval from other people. How often do you say yes when you want to say no? How often do you make yourself smaller? or hide your true feelings or opinions so that you don't offend others. This is part of what we're going to be talking about on the podcast today. Welcome to Wonderfully Made. We're going to talk about people pleasing. And here is a great description from Scott Motts. People pleasing behavior is when you're hungry for approval and eager to avoid conflict. And so you say yes, even when you don't want to. You might also tell a little untruth to avoid hurt feelings and you suppress your real opinions and beliefs in order to get along and make things smoother. You might even take on more and more so as not to disappoint or be disliked until you reach the point of overwhelm. The Bible speaks directly to the issue of the heart of the issue in this, and that's what we're going to dive into. We have an amazing woman, best-selling author, blogger, and podcaster, Grace Valentine. What a great name, Grace. I love your name. Joining us for a conversation on moving past the opinions of others to live a courageous life of freedom. Welcome. Yes, I'm so excited to be here, Christy. I really admire your podcast, and it's so fun to always talk to someone else. And you're in California, right? I'm in California. Where are you? I'm in Florida. So it's like the completely opposite side of the country. And I think that's kind of cool that you can be literally on the other side of the country. Same God. Cool conversations can happen. And even with like social media, there can be so much bad things that can come from social media or, or the internet, but it's cool when God can use a bad thing and make it a good thing because it's a God thing. So even like the fact that we're talking here today and we're connected, that's, it's really cool. Yes. I think. Yes. I love that. I love that. I love that you're bringing that, that like technology has the power for good. And oh, that, exactly. Yes. So true. Um, and so speaking of media, so in addition to your uh, I'm Tired podcast and your blog, you have a new book coming out this summer called What Will They Think? Nine mm-hmm. Women in the Bible Who Can Help You Live Your Life Boldly. Yes, Which, I'm so excited. Yes. <laughs> so exciting. I mean, this is such a timely topic of women living their life boldly in a biblical way, which I think there's so much, so much to explore there. So so this, this book has a central topic that I just can't wait to dive into today. And that is how we can stop seeking validation from other people yeah. and instead live a courageous life we were meant to live. So now I want to turn it over to you and hear from you, Grace. What moved you to write this book at this point in your faith journey? Yeah, I think... Honestly, I remember the moment I knew I wanted to write on woman in the Bible very clearly. I had like a girl message me and a lot of younger girls follow me. And there's just so many messages. I think that generation and my generation gets about the Bible and scripture, how it's so old and that it hates women. And I remember a girl messaged me saying like, I hate that scripture. Like, I want to believe in Jesus. Like every time I pray, I feel his presence and like, it, it feels good to like know who God is and I feel peaceful. But at the end of the day, I hate the way that scripture talks about women. Um, I'm just a girl who's super independent and I'm so proud of like my job that I want to do. And I hate that people like, you know, in scripture, especially is what she's saying, hates women and that God hates women. And I was like, that, that is not God. But I start to realize, honestly, if we start looking and thinking that the Bible makes women after thoughts of scripture, we're going to, of course, believe the lie that God hates women, you know, but when you actually open up the Bible, women aren't afterthoughts, like God placed so many women there and in scripture. And this is a time when that wasn't even common. Like the women weren't even given like a chance to speak often. They weren't even allowed sometimes, most times speak in the temple or the church. And so the idea that still women are woven in the scripture, doing crazy, cool, bold, courageous things, um, learning some lessons the hard way, still being a little bit messy, like all of us are, human beings are. But that showed me that I, as a woman, can be bold in my calling. I can walk in purpose and not in seeking approval from other people. And I wanted other women to know that because I think right now in our like in books especially if it's like self-help or something it's so easy to see a lot of books that are like you're the queen bee like you know be the baddie like you've got it girl like it's all up to you you're the hero of your life and then it's easy to see scripture and like not scripture but other Christian books maybe that kind of say oh 
woman, like getting married is like your biggest, best blessing in your life. And your life is all about being a sidekick. And that's neither of those narratives are true. Like when you look at scripture and so like being married can be a way that you can, you know, expand the gospel, but each of us have this beautiful purpose. And from like, maybe it's childbearing, maybe it's being a leader in the politics sector, like Deborah was someone in the Bible, you know, it's just really cool to see that. And I just feel like there's such a need for my generation, all generations to see that women are included in scripture. God loves women and God calls women up. And when you start, stop living for the approval of others and you stop thinking, mm, I wonder what they'll think of me if I do this. Yeah. Two things come to mind as you're sharing that. The first one is Rahab, formerly Rahab the prostitute, becomes, mm. I th- is it Solomon's mom or grandma? I can't remember exactly, but yeah. right? Like she's yeah. like his mom. Yeah, I think. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but- I think Rahab became... Anyway, whether she's his mom or his grandma, somebody can fact check us on this and send us an email, but she, she becomes, she, she, God puts her in the lineage of Jesus because Mm. of her faith in God. And so, you know, that's like, you know, just, just, um, addressing that, you know, conception that the Bible hates women. I mean, I actually think that Jesus was a radical supporter of women and you know mary magdalene the bible honors her as really the the only disciple if you will she wasn't officially one of the 12 but one of the disciples of jesus who was there with him at the cross and who was faithful to him until then i mean women were last of the cross first of the tomb and you know that's and the go and tell was told go and tell your brothers and so i think it's easy to put this narrative of like oh you as a woman i mean you can lead a woman's Sunday school and that that can be a great holy thing but I think it's really cool to think that women were put in the gospel and in scripture to be world changers to point to Christ who ultimately can save the world and save everyone's souls and that we in our lives today like whether you're in your dead-end job it feels like whether you're a mother with three teenagers who are driving you crazy whether you're a young girl in college like God has placed you there for a reason and you can be bold in that calling but you're never going to be able to be bold if you don't one notice how beautiful scripture is and how it includes women and two if you're just so busy listening to what other people think you know if that's what you're listening to versus what scripture and what God's calling you up to then you're going to miss out on it and so it's like that helps you see that and I think I always say like I never felt more woman empowerment till I read the scriptures you know and I think that's a little different than what the world tells us. Um, but scripture to me and like hearing those stories, whether it's Rahab or whether it's Mary Magdalene and just her testimony and going from having demons casted from her for following Jesus and serving him so well, or even one of the women I talk about in this book is Tabitha. And there's not much we know about Tabitha. She's like an ax nine and she just sewed clothes for the widows and the poor in her area. And Peter came and rose her from the dead um, because she was dead and they cleaned and everything. And what she did was she just looked around and she loved the overlooked in her area. And that was a beautiful, bold calling of hers. And so I think sometimes we get caught up in being the main character or the hero, but it's so cool to look at scripture and realize that the bold this and the best legacy you can leave is one that looks at Jesus and follows his approval and his purpose and not the opinions of others. What you're saying really points to the heart of the matter. And that is that each of us have a unique calling, right? Esther was called to be a queen. Tabitha was called to be a seamstress. And you know Mm. what? The impact was seen as equal in the kingdom of God. There's no lesser callings in God's kingdom. And so the most fruitful thing we can do in our lives is to live into that. Okay. This is so good. So excited. So will you share just to bring it to like a personal level for you, what people pleasing has looked like for you and sort of the impact that you saw it, you know, having on your life? Yeah, I think just growing up, even whether it's in the church or whether it's not in the church, I mean, growing up, especially body image was something I struggled with as a high school girl. And like I had an eating disorder. It was all I could kind of think about was getting hotter, getting like a revenge body, proving middle school bullies, high school bullies, ex-boyfriends wrong, you know, like becoming this hot girl. And I think that's even nowadays, a lot of young girls have that hot girl summer mentality, like is what they say. Um, And so I think that was my first addiction to it of being like, and I remember getting compliments when I got skinnier, even though I was doing it in an unhealthy way. And that was like a drug when you're like, you get that approval. Um, But then it's never enough. You know, you 
they're like, oh my gosh, how'd you get your body? What'd you do? And then you feel this pressure to like keep pleasing them. Like as if you are on stage when you're just some girl in the suburbs, you know, like just, and you're acting like their opinion and their compliments mean the world. And it's not wrong to be a words of affirmation person, but if that becomes like something you idolize and crave and need, and that's your foundation, then you're once again, like you're missing out. And so that is something I struggle with. And then I went to college and I think it, like most girls in college, I think people are like, oh, well, the normal college thing to do is to go to parties, drink a lot, get asked to frat formal. And that became my life. And I was very much someone in the party scene. Like I even still get nervous when someone's like, oh, I knew someone who graduated from Baylor with you. And I'm like, oh, really? Uh, please say that see me at that party. Like, you know, I, I still even... And that's what's ironic is me drinking for those parties and me still today getting nervous when someone mentions that they knew of me in college. Both those things can be sinful because I'm caring about what other people think of me. I'm like, oh, well, nowadays I struggle with being like, well, they still think I'm like worthy of being an author and in this Christian sector. If they knew I was a drunk girl, I'm like, wait, that's not the gospel. That's other people's opinion and my reputation, you know? And I think it's just a mixture of all that. And even just in first jobs after work like you know you're doing everything to impress your boss and once again it's not wrong to work hard it's not wrong to work out but when that becomes something that is intoxicating for you um if you are literally going to parties for other people's approval and not even enjoying it not even realizing why you're there if you're making decisions that you think you have to and that aren't holy and aren't something that feel like your identity then you're missing out and so i think especially with summer coming up. I mean, body image is even still today something that I struggle with. And I know all women of all generations struggle with. And it's so easy, I think, in the lie that society tells us to think we as women are meant to be someone to please other people. Um, and that might be a soft-spoken young girl. And I think even being in Christian settings, I've always been more of an outspoken person. And I think the Bible and reading scripture scriptures has been so freeing for me because, you know, they were soft-spoken women in the Bible and they were loud-spoken. They were, there were women who doubted like Sarah who laughed and God called her out for that. And there were women who, like we said, Tabitha, who just sewed and were very, like, we don't know much about the personality, but like, it's cool to think that all those personalities were used for the gospel. And yeah, I mean, I don't know about you. Do, do you, did you ever struggle with any of those things too? Like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Way? Oh yeah. Yeah. And I mean, from, so I was a model when I was younger. I, that's what I did to make money. Oh college. goodness. Gosh. That culture yeah. is so hard. I've heard from people. It, well, I think you called it out. We, I yeah. mean, for me, I started basing, am I okay by how do I look? And mm. I, I started using beauty as a weapon. I weaponized beauty in order to put up a false mask to protect myself. And I think that can apply to whatever it is. And I think you said that so well, Grace, it can be work. It can be success. It can be good grades. It can be, you know, partying and being popular, however that looks, you know, it can be, it can even be putting the opinions of people in the church mm. over the opinion of God. Amen. And that's sometimes that's still today. Like I said to you, when I go to something and someone's like, did you know this from from Baylor? I get like anxious and that's my sin. And I have to call that out and I have to be like, okay, I'm trying to please these church people and make it feel like I fit in. I wasn't ever called to fit in. We're called to be a body of many parts. And that means that we're all going to bring something different to the table. And if someone is gossiping about me because of my past, then wow, look at Mary Magdalene. Like look at these women in the Bible who they were not focused on what people thought of who they used to be. They were looking forward at Christ. And like, I even think, I know me personally, every time I've looked back on my past or in a way that I'm antagonizing it, or if I look back into the left and to the right of what people are saying about me, I miss out on the blessings in my present that are forward. And like, we're called to press on and not figure out what other people are saying about us. And that's, and that's hard, to, easy to say and hard to do because here I am someone, and here you are, you host a Christian podcast. I wrote a book about this and it's still something that I have to battle daily, but it's a battle that's worth fighting daily because it's what gives you peace and freedom. You can't just wake up and think it's going to bippity boppity boo right way. And you're never going to care about what people think of you, but you have to wake up every day and say, you know, I'm going to care more about Christ. I'm going to pray for a perspective that helps me look forward and not to the left and to my right. And that is what helps you walk in that freedom. Yes. Yes. And tuning into the voice of the Holy spirit, which is really, you know, what you're saying in order to know our identity and walk forward, we need to be listening to God. And 
in asking, you know, Mm -hmm. God, let me, you know, maybe you're listening to this podcast and you're like, I don't know if I hear God's voice or sometimes I get confused and, you know, I don't know if it's me or God pray and ask God to just make it clear to you when he's speaking, you know, and you know, if it, you know, it's not God, if it's a voice of accusation, right. Oh, wow. Like you blew it. You blew it again. Or, oh, you, you know, you just, you, you're so unclear, like on what to do, you know, if it's a discouraging voice, you know, that's not the voice of God, but in order to walk in our true identity, we need to seek God and, you know, seek him in the Bible and seek him in the living word, which is Jesus and Mm -hmm. listen to, you know, listen to his voice for us. So, okay. So I want to know, like, practically, are there any practices that you put into place in your life in the past or now um, Mm -hmm. to stop seeking validation from other people? Well, I always think the first one is to be honest with other people around you, that that's something you struggle with. I mean, I even think when I was going through like body image struggles or even work, I had to say, stop complimenting me for these things that are not worthy. Like, can you focus your compliments on things that are spirit led, you know? And I had to tell some close friends that, and they didn't mean it that way. They were like, you look great. Your body looks great. Like they're being girls, like hype girls, cheerleaders, but even the compliments, if you allow the compliments to name you and be something that controlled, then definitely when there's no compliments or if there's snickering or if there's gossip, that's going to tear you down. So I remember talking to like my good Christian friends. I'm like, hold me accountable by not, not making compliments or words of affirmation about something that's not holy, you know? And so I think just talking to your people and your cheerleaders and being honest that honestly that's something you're struggling with like if grades is what you're struggling with if your job is say hey remind me my worth isn't that I don't need like a you go girl you be that bad queen b energy like I need someone who's gonna say I want your holy energy like I want to see you be holy and do holy things not main character things and so I think creating that environment is so crucial and then also you talked about prayer and listening for God's voice and I love that because I think we have totally tried to make God speak to us in only one way through a physical voice. And most of us will maybe never will hear a physical voice in our lifetime. And so my challenge for anyone struggling with people pleasing is kind of getting yourself out there, like praying, looking at nature. I always say like, we talk about love languages when it comes to like humans, like, Oh, are you words of affirmation? Are you physical touch? Are you acts of service quality time? Um, our faith should be using all those love languages, honestly, with Christ. Like if you can't hear God through words, and if you've been reading his scripture and it doesn't feel like it's clicking, like try acts of service, try go mentoring a young girl, try going out, even like physical, like it might be praying on your knees, like that physical touch with Christ, or it may even just being in nature, you know, um, not even maybe quality time. I know when I go on a walk, if I'm so stressed about gossip or what people think of me, I have to take myself a, like away from my current setting, change my placement to something where I can say, you know, if God has this, the whole sun, the sun rises every day, he figures that crap out. Like surely he's going to figure out my placement in this life. Surely he's not putting people in my life or taking people away for something just because he wants to see me suffer. Like there's a greater purpose for that. And so those are like the main things. I mean, check your surroundings, you know, check your friendships, have them hold you accountable for what you and who you want to be and uh, make sure you're in a church. I know that's like the easy thing said, but I think with COVID we've all gotten so used to just watching church and no one knows us, but if you're not known, then how can you be pushed to Christ? You know, you have to be known in order to honestly be called up. And I know that's for me, something that can be hard. I like to stay like, I like to be independent. I don't want people to think I'm dependent on them, but it's so beautiful when we see Christ that the people around us can be the same people who represent that love. And sometimes you may not hear a physical voice, even though I do believe God can speak to us through his spirit, but you may have a friend who is praying to, and they get a word from Christ and that may be what you need in that moment. And so checking those things. Mm. Community, community. I, that's, that's a good one. Um, yeah. And, you know, on this, on this note of hearing from God, you know, like, When we, because I think this is such an integral ingredient, right? I think about each one of these women in the Bible, and I want to ask you who your favorite was writing about the nine or which one resonated with you in a second. But I think each one of these women heard directly from the spirit of God. Mm. And that is as believers, I think we really need to tune into when, as we're seeking Jesus and his word, and we're seeking him in community and 
I love what you said about making the physical space for ourselves to seek God, right? Mm. Like Jesus didn't come to die so that maybe we might hear from him once in a while. Like he said, and it's, it's, I mean, how much do we really receive this? Like, it's better for you that I go. Sometimes I'm like, are you sure? Wow. I just want you to come back right now. Yeah, um, like that was you. Yeah, it, it's easy to think that. and But that's true. That's scripture. That's his word. Yes, totally. And so I just, I just am hopeful, you know, for each one of us that's here together today that we can really press into, there's so many false things in this world. You know, just this thing of live for yourself. Well, that's empty. That leads us nowhere, right? Find your identity, you know, and I love what you're like, be the queen bee and like all this stuff. And like, that's not going to do it for us. And it's also not going to do it for us to be going around trying to seek our identity and validation from other people. So maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said the road is narrow, right? It's who's going to make the time and space, who's going to prioritize me to learn to hear from my spirit and to, to seek me. So Okay. That actually uh, remind me of a story. Let me tell a story real quick. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. It was in my second book, but I ran my first half marathon and I know I'm not like a, I'm not someone you look at and be like, she's a runner, but I actually really enjoy running. And I thought I like created a good playlist and I was in North Carolina mountains. And so like, I was playing, all going to play all these like bad girl music that was going to get me so pumped up, help me through it. And then I got to mile three and it was a beautiful view. And it was the same place that I actually even like accepted Christ for the first time, same city, same mountains area. I was at a childhood camp, but now I was like 22 doing a half marathon. And then I'll never forget. I turned the corner and I lost reception. And for some reason, all my music was just gone. And I was like, what am I going to do? I have like 10 more miles and I don't have any reception or music. And I very much in that moment was like, God, you have to talk to me. Like, I have to pray. Like, this is going to be a time when I'm praying and I have 10 miles and I did not train well for that half marathon. And honestly, in that moment, I felt God's spirit. I felt his voice comfort me. I felt like conversations with him. Like it, I would look around and I could see. And so I would encourage anyone to feel like they can't hear God speak, or you're like these women in the Bible hear God speak. I never even was still enough with my mind to give God a chance to speak. And I think sometimes we just need to hear that, that you, if you haven't even given God a chance to speak, you've been busy, you've been doing it all. And you haven't even stopped to slow down and let him have a chance to talk. You know, you've been interrupting him this whole time. And I think that's what I felt in that moment. Cause I was in a season where I was like, I don't hear you speak. And the minute I had no choice, but to listen to him. And I wasn't in a rush because I think with quiet times, we are like, Oh, well, I have 15 minutes to read scripture. Like, mm, like God, can you work with my timeline? Um, it should be a conversation throughout the day with him. You know, it should be something you think about daily, you know? And so that's just something that I think I learned the hard way having no music. I think I had one song Ed Sheeran 18, but I could not listen to that for 13 miles. And so it was good for me. Yeah. And this other thing that you brought up to this, this necessary ingredient that I want to double down on for all of us. And that is honesty, right? Mm -hmm. And it, that is, that is a integral ingredient in this is in order for us to hear God. A lot of times we need to be honest with God. Mm -hmm. first. He doesn't need our Christianese, you know, if you're like, well, that's good. Cause I don't have any, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't do church yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Like wherever you're on, you know, the spectrum today, coming to God with your honesty in, in your heart and really wanting to hear from him, he's going to show up for you. Um, mm. So Grace, before we get to this, this question of your, your favorite female, which I'm just so excited to hear about when you, you know, as you've been in this process of really being honest with your friends and being honest mm -hmm. with God and making space for him. Like what have you discovered about yourself through this process? Yeah, I think I've just discovered a lot of my flaws, but I've been uh, like there and there's flaws that are like when it's a flaw that's rooted in my selfishness or the enemy or my temptation, that's, that's bad. But I've, and I've noticed those things, but I've also noticed, I'd say, through this whole self-discovery, my flaws is in things that I can't be. And I wasn't called to be, you know, like I have some friends who I look at her and she is like, 
I think of almost like, you know, we call Jesus the Prince of Peace, wonderful counselor or whatever. And I look at her and she's like that wonderful counselor part. And that's something that I can grow on and having a gentle spirit and listening. But I also am like, that's her spiritual gift. And there are other things that Christ has equipped me for. And I think we have this mentality that in order to move forward on a purpose, we have to kind of be the best at everything. And I think the beautiful thing about when you're honest about the gifts God's given you is you also see the gaps you have and you see the gifts that other people have that you don't. And you learn that that's not something that I, God's neglected for me. Like it's something I can celebrate in her. And I can also see that there's other things for me and I can also notice it in her and praise it and accept it. And I think especially with women, we don't mean to, but society has kind of made us competitive with each other. And I've seen that spirit in me of kind of that like mentality. A lot of younger girls do it. Like their ex-boyfriend gets a new girlfriend. You look them up on social media, you show your friends and you're like, is she prettier? Is she better than me? And everyone's like, no girl, she's not. You know what the truth is, there's always someone prettier than you. There's always someone smarter than you. There may be someone better at their job at your work than you. There may be someone at the church who's a better worshiper than you and singer. And that, but that's not something to like be upset about. That's something to celebrate their gifts and not look at them as competition because we're not supposed to compete against our teammates. And I think this self-discovery for me and not caring what people think of me is stop trying to be this person who can do it all. Like I have the, I have Christ who can do all things, you know, and all things I can do through his strength, not my own strength. You know, I'm weak. Like there are so many gaps I have, but I can celebrate the way he shows up in other people and realize they're not my competition, you know? And I think women, especially and blame it on society, but we've gotten competitive with each other, but that's such a waste of our time. And I, I hate that we have done that because we're not fighting the real enemy if we're fighting each other. Wow. And, and I think that gets to, to this thing of making ourselves feeling like, feeling like we're either better than or worse than, right? Exactly. When, yeah. and, and that's going to breed that's insecurity. Either. Yeah. That is going to breed so much insecurity. What if throughout our day, we just practiced every single person that we met, whether they're homeless, whether they're, you know, a, a multi-billionaire who's doing whatever, whether they're whatever. And we said in our minds, equal. Mm. We are not better than anybody. We are not less than anybody. And I think if we could carry that around with us, you know, that will help us in all of our relationships, including our relationship with ourself. Um, Okay. So in your book, you share uh, stories from nine women in the Bible that cultivated lives of courage instead of people pleasing. Is there a woman that you like related to the most? And if so, why, or just share with us about these nine women, whatever comes to mind. Gosh, I mean, I love that you asked that because I really, I'm thinking of them through and each one, I, I think the beautiful thing about it is each one, I see some sort of something in me. Like I see when Sarah doubts God and laughs at God, when he first would like, when God approaches a woman named Sarah and says, Hey, you're going to get pregnant. She's like, no way. And she tries to take control of the situation, has her husband sleep with Hagar. And that didn't, that's not what God was trying to tell her. You know, I relate a lot to that. Um, but I think especially Hagar was someone that I didn't really know about. And I started reading scripture and I think I felt very overlooked in my life. And I get, maybe some people are like, okay, you know, you feel overlooked. I feel overlooked more, but I think a lot of women, we feel overlooked that there's always someone else. And I think Hagar was a woman that I maybe don't fully relate to, but I understand. I'm like, she has been overlooked and I don't understand her completely because she was a slave. Like she was abused, but I mean, there's been some trauma. I think we've all gone through where we feel overlooked and God even called her back to a really hard situation. But the beautiful thing was God looked at her and called her by name. And she was in an air, like a time where no one called her by name. And she called God, the God who sees me. And when I read that over and over again, I prayed over that. I think that is who I think of God is to me, like in a world where I've been rejected, I've been hurt, I've been betrayed. I have a God who looks at me, calls me by name when other people just would walk by me and they would just shame me. Um, and I just think that's a beautiful picture to think of like, this is the God who sees me. So this is the God who sees you listening. You know, this is the God who is part of your life, sees you, calls you by name, even though other people have totally overlooked you. And so she was someone I just very much admired because she went through a lot. And I think the fact that she was one of the first people to even like acknowledge who God was in that beautiful characteristic in itself was very meaningful for me. But I also talked about Tabitha and I just, I love Tabitha because we don't know 
We don't know what Tabitha looked like, if she was married. We don't know much about her, but we just know in the one verse it says about her and describes her is that she was kind and cared for the poor people. And that's the kind of life I want to live. I think I am a goal person. Like, I mean, I have dreams, like want those things to happen and I'm a hard worker. But then at the day when I read this story about Tabitha too, that's when I was like, you know what? Like if I can, at the end of my life, have people who say I was kind and cared about poor people and the overlooked, that is the kind of woman I want to be. That's a legacy worth living. It's no one remembers her body. No one remembers if she was married or her relationship status, but they remember that she was kind. And so that also impacted me. So I kind of gave you like two and that, but I'm sure everyone has someone unique to them and you can kind of relate to them all, which is a beautiful thing about scripture. There's so much to ponder there. I'm just kind of saying. Do you have one? Do you have one woman in the Bible in general that you admire? Mary Magdalene is definitely, you know, I just, um, I just, I love it that she, um, I I just illustrates, you know, the power of Jesus in our lives Mm -hmm. that none of us are too far gone. Right. I mean, I think we, we have a tendency to really listen to the voice of the accuser when we're you know, when we're just trying to sort through stuff and that voice comes in and it's just like, you're, you're just, you're never going to get this right, you know, or you just, you keep messing up or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. I I don't know, you know, what the voice of the accuser sounds like in each of our lives here today, but, but Jesus cast demons out of this woman. And then Mm -hmm. she was like, he appeared to her first. (laughs) He rose from the dead and appeared to her first. And I will never get over that. And tells her, go and tell, which is to me, I think it's so easy to think, okay, well, okay. Yeah. God loves me, but God also wants to use you for something so cool. The idea that the lead, that she's the last person that anyone thought. And I think that's even what makes scripture so much real. Like all these people who put the Bible together, that's not the story they would have written in that time. The thing that a woman who was looked so down upon by culture was the one that Jesus rose from the dead and talked to first. But that is a radical savior who loves women, who cares for women, who loves us all, who isn't going to follow the world standard. He's going to follow the whole, like his father, who he is, you know? And I think that I, I admire that too. And I think that speaks not only to Mary Magdalene, but mainly to like Christ and who he is and who he can use us to be. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And each one of these women, you know, um, there's a guy named Jamie Winship, great Bible teacher. And he says, you know, he tells the story of when the woman came in and she cried on Jesus's feet and wiped his feet with her tears and all the Pharisees were standing by. How could you let this happen? Don't you know that she's a prostitute? And Mm -hmm. Jesus looked around the room and was like, I don't see a prostitute here. And looks at her and says, daughter, that's Mm. who he saw her as. And I think like, that's what each of us need to hear from Jesus. Jesus, what is my identity in you? Because I think that in order to stop people pleasing in a way that is godly, like you're saying, in a way that is holy, we need to know our true identity in, in Christ and be walking in that, right? So that we don't feel greater than or less than, um, All right. So last question. Um, So for, well, second to last question for the young woman listening today, Grace, who's, you know, maybe struggling to move past the opinions of others or finds herself saying yes, when she wants to say no, or just feels trapped by other people's expectations. What is your encouragement to her today? Yeah. I first think I would tell her you're not going to be able to please everyone. So just give it up. You know, there's you, there's no winning, you know, there's, it's, it's a trap. Like it's a scam from the world and the enemy for you to do that. And the enemy wants you to waste your time trying to please other people, because in those moments, you're not going to notice your bold purpose in the legacy you could leave if you looked at Christ. And so you can live this life and be restless and try your best, work your butt off, do all the things But if you're going to miss out on a legacy and a life that's worth living, not worth living, every life's worth living, but a life that's radical and has this legacy to have this courageous faith if you don't look at Christ. And I would say also that you're not stuck in the thoughts of others. I think it's easy to think like, oh, this is just the way life is will be. And I'll always think this way. Like, no, you can read scripture, start changing your everyday perspective. And slowly you can watch just like almost like when you start eating healthy food 
you begin to feel better. You know, start putting in your day things that point you to Christ and not to what Sarah says about you or to what your high school bullies think of you or to what your ex-boyfriend thinks of you or your ex-husband. You know, start putting things in the practice that give you a perspective of Christ. And that would be the main thing I would say. And also just especially when you're young, there's so many beauty standards. There's so many things that you can't live up to. I would say you're never going to be the prettiest girl in the room. You're never going to be the most successful, but you can be someone who sees their Christ in the room with them. And that God, who, the God who sees them see, is with them and walking them, calling them daughter right now. And so focus on that because that's something you can do and it's not right, but it's true, you know? And so you can't do it perfectly, but you can do it truthfully and honestly and focus on that instead of wasting your time trying to be, like we said, less or more. That's good. Okay, last question. If you could give your younger self one piece of advice, how old would she be and what would you tell her? Ooh, I love that question because literally one of my favorite quotes ever is be who you needed when you were younger. And I think that's something that, both of us probably try to live out because part of the reason we probably do these things is because we know what it's like to be broken and hurt. Um, I think, and when I think of my younger self, I'm thinking of like my 19, 20 year old self in college, just kind of frat party in life. And I think what I would tell her is that God's plan is better than your present worries, you know? And I think I look at back, like whether it was a breakup or whether it was rejection or whether it was constantly worrying about what other people think of me. I just wish I could go back and tell her like God's plan is so much. This is just literally one bump in the road. So like if someone's listening to this today, honestly, you may be having a really hard day, but this isn't even a hard chapter. This is just one paragraph that you're going through and God's going to use that. Um, and a bad thing can be a good thing if it's a God thing. So your hardship today is horrible and it sucks, but God's going to be able to redeem that and use that. And so that's what I think I would tell her. And also I think stop trying to grow up so fast. That's my like more secular. I think I just remember being 19, 20 ready for the next, you know, um, there's something so beautiful in your current season. You don't need to, you don't need to have it all. I mean, I was working for money, overwhelmed, stressed, wondering who I was going to be, but there's something so beautiful about that in between season too. Thank you, Grace. Thanks. Thank you for being with us today. Um, for oh. those of you listening who want to connect with Grace, who want to check out her blog, um, we will have all those resources in the show notes for you. So this has just been a really fun conversation, a really timely conversation. And, um, you know, I think my prayer for each one of us today is just that we will just, I just love that visual Grace. It's really sticking with me of getting out in nature or getting that space wherever we can and just making that, making that space for Jesus. I think everything else is going to flow from that. Yeah. Give him a chance to talk to you. You know, I even want something I do that's tangible too, is when I drive, it's so easy to want to go ahead and put that Bluetooth on like, and have even a podcast or your music playing. And I would just turn it off and just pray and talk to God. And there's sometimes I even talk out loud and I'm like, if someone looks to the left or right, they're probably like, who is this crazy woman talking to herself? But I'm like, I'm in my car. No one can see. And I think it's just beautiful when you give God a chance to speak. Mm, give God a chance to speak. We'll, we'll end it there. Thanks, Grace.